Martin, APS Director of Expertising. Ken. Thanks very much, Kathy. I'm pleased to be here with you today. I'm relatively new as Director of Expertising, but I've worked for the APS for a little bit over 25 years and did vol volunteer for the APS a number of years before that. Uh, it's good to see a lot of faces I know and some faces I don't know. Uh, besides me, beside me is Crystal Harder, uh, who's worked for the APS just over 40 years. Um, most of that with expertising, uh, maybe a couple years early on before expertising was formally a separate department. Um, I thought I'd just give a very brief overview of expertising and the importance and the role it plays at the APS, but the intent is the bulk. Uh, hopefully, if we have till 25 after at least 15 minutes, you can ask questions um, and, and back and forth with uh, anything. But just as an overview, the expertising or sample authentication has really been an issue for the APS since the APS was founded in 1886. You can find uh, concerns and, and talk about it from the very first minutes um, when the society was founded. Um, our first certificates, I believe, were issued in 1903. Um, there was a suspension for a while, but um, expertising has been a, an important service um, to, uh, because unfortunately, fakes, forgeries, and misrepresented stamps have been an issue basically almost as long as stamp collecting has existed. Um, currently, we receive about 5,000 items a year to be expertized, mm. to be authenticated. Um, and that's items from all parts of the world. Um, many of our competitors are, are US only or primarily US. Um, a significant portion of our stamps are worldwide. Um, because of that, while many, well, some of our competitors only have one or two or a very small number of experts to cover the entire world, um, we need a large committee. So we have about 180 people um, basically throughout the United States um, who serve as experts. Um, most items, uh, if they're sent into us, will go out to two external experts. In some cases, it could be three, four, or five, maybe a few rare cases, even more than that. In addition to be look, being looked at, examined by myself, and um, another internal expert basically would be the second signer on our certificates. Um, we suggest allowing 90 days for the process. Again, the stamps come in here, we'll look at them, we'll try to assign them to the best experts. Um, they go out, come back, go out, come back. Um, we may look at them with equipment, we may compare them to material in our reference collection, we may pull um, information from the library, we may use the, the VSC 6000, uh, which is a sophisticated piece of equipment. So it, it takes some time. In fact, right now, unfortunately, we were shut down for about two months uh, related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're, we're working right now to get back to about 90 days. Um, the, the items I typed up yesterday were, the last ones were from May 1. Um, so we're a little bit more than 90 days, but we'll be working over the next couple months to get that down. We'd like most items to be returned within 60 days, with, with, I'd like to have half of the items returned within 45 days, but um, don't expect getting something back in a week or two. Um, fees are charged based on catalog value um, for items. Um, we have a different fee schedule for members versus non-members. Uh, for members, it's about half the cost. And if you're submitting more than one item, it's almost certain that it'd be less expensive if you become an APS member. Uh, than if you uh, aren't an APS member. Um, other, two other things I'd like to point out. Um, on our website, stamps.org, um, we have a certificate archive. So you can, anybody, this is not restricted to members, anybody can go and look at the opinions basically issued since uh, July 1, 2004. 2004, yeah, mm -hmm. that's correct. Um, so you can search by country and, and catalog number, and you can see, uh, get an idea of how many items have been submitted. You can get some idea of how likely something might turn out to be the, the stamp that, uh, if you think you have a 596, it's not very likely. Um, maybe one or two out of six or 700 over that period have turned out to be a 596. That's one of the most common ones that people hope they have a fortune, so to speak. Um, we also, 
uh, the reference collection, which you may be able to see some of the albums behind me in this office. Uh, we have over 500 volumes of genuine stamps, about 100 volumes of Bates and forgeries as well. Um, portions of the reference collection are also available on our website um, to, to view. If you look under services of reference collection, um, certainly not everything, and the impossible for everything as we incorporate new material into the reference collection on a on a regular basis, but we've taken snapshots. Return to normal. Anybody's off welcome to visit the APS um, again, and then we, you can, if you're able to visit the APS, you could view anything in the reference collection as well um, during our normal business hours. You want to add anything, Crystal? Anything nope. forgotten? I think you covered it all. Then, uh, Kathy, do you have questions or should I be looking at the chat? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. There are two questions right now. The first one, who at the APS is currently qualified to operate the VSC 6000? Um, and, and I am relatively new in the position. I've had some training by when it was delivered but I wouldn't consider myself uh, very qualified at this point in time. Um, the first concern right now is getting the, the backlog from the shutdown of the pandemic um, taken care of. And then we will, um, I'll get more training and be more familiarize myself with it. Um, it's not being used extensively at this point in time. I think it's going to be a, a build up time. I mean, you have to um, have reference copies and and reference things you can't just can't just plop a stamp under and, and it's going to it doesn't come out and say this is counterfeit or or faked or or it's a certain color or whatever you have to build up a reference base of information and that's going to take some time um, it was a donation to us i believe last september it was delivered um, a, a pretty expensive piece of equipment would cost about a hundred thousand dollars new um, we do look forward to using it we're glad to have it um, but I can't say it's being fully utilized. We're not fully utilizing the potential yet, but we will get there. Um, I see another one. Fred Lawrence said, PF, the Philatelic Foundation has been offering some discount services for limited periods of time. Um, Apex had an offer for, or has an offer in Lens advertised for people who haven't previously used the service. Um, six certificates for the price of five. Uh, uh, we don't have a problem with not getting, um, July was one of what, the, we got more items in in July than we had had for like any month for 10 years or one of the best months for 10 years. So we don't have an issue with having to get material. Um, so um, we are um, not gonna offer any fire sale, I don't think, right? We're more, we're more concerned with getting the stuff uh, done on a timely basis and giving people good value for their money. And with regards to the, the VSC 6000, we had intended to run during summer seminar 2020, a course on analytical philately that used that or in forensics. Those courses filled up in the first day of registration and we hope to be able to run those during summer seminar in 2021 again. So the next question we have is, they're coming in fast and furious. I see one about color references. Yes, are there any uh, good go-to color references for regular collectors to use on a normal basis? Well, the, the best is obviously actual examples that have been certified, but for United States stamps, you have R.H. White's Encyclopedia of the Colors of the United States. Uh, looks backwards, but uh, this would be, this is an out of print book. It is pretty expensive. It might run you four or $500, a couple volumes, um, but that's a, a reference that we have. Um, yeah, though, I don't think you can check it out from the library though. Um, the color is, color is a challenge. Uh, that's one of the, the greatest challenges, I think, for expertizing. Um, so the, the best is obviously having reference copies. Uh, a damaged stamp, a space filler, can, will be 
perfect as a as a reference copy for for color. Um, and some people spend years building up those for their own collections. All right, another question. If you have an expensive stamp or cover that comes up as a fake, does it have any philatelic value at that point, or is it just something you should toss out? Well, we would prefer to get it off the, the market, and when you get your certificate back, you may get a slip of paper. You aren't going to be able to read this, something like this, which says, uh, note to the owner, help us remove spurious material from the hobby and unsuspecting collectors. Please concern donating your fake forged counterfeit or altered stamps to our reference collection. Um, so yes, we have, we got, uh, just yesterday we opened the donation of a, um, of a collection of fake and forged stamps. I can't really even remember what country. So we certainly appreciate, um, we have an excellent one, Lois Evans de Bellini for Japan. Um, so yes, uh, fakes, forgeries, counterfeits certainly have value as to help with the expertizing process um, to help determine whether a stamp is, is genuine. It's good to have real copies and, and fake copies to compare to both. If a stamp is deemed to be a forgery, is the fee charged as though the stamp was legit or is there a sliding scale of some sort? Um, normally the fee would be no more than $30 would be charged. So if you submitted a couple hundred dollars because you're hoping it was a $20,000 stamp, um, you would be refunded. In many cases uh, where we think it's unlikely that it's actually a real stamp, if you submit an item that's a, as a 596 and you give a credit card, we probably will only charge the $30 because we know from um, that the likelihood of that being actually determined to be a 596 is, is so minimal. Um, so uh, no, we do not charge as if the stamp was legit. So can you explain the fee structure for people who are not familiar with it? Right. The fee structure is, is included on the website and in the expertizing application. Uh, I have one in my hand um, and it's based on catalog value. For an APS member, it starts at $20 for an item with a catalog value of 200 or less. For a non-member, it starts at $40. So there's definitely incentive to be a member. We want you to be a member. Um, $200 to $500 catalog value, it's $25 for a member, $45 for a non-member. Um, $500 to $1,000, $30 for a member, and $50 for a non-member. Above $1,000, it's 3% of the catalog value for an APS member to a maximum of $400. For a non-member, it's 5% to a maximum of $800. So Mark says, I've noticed that no explanation is given when a stamp is considered to have been chemically altered to remove or change a color. What methods are used to determine that this is the case? Um, well, normally there is evidence of the color still there um, under magnification. Uh, depends on the printing process, but there's probably um, color dots um, if it was done by a, a gravure, or there's probably cyan, magenta, yellow, and black dots. Um, um, litho, well, it's a, a litho, um, depending on the printing process. Um, we, we are really trying to look at the questions people ask, and sometimes we will put supplemental notes in. Um, I think yesterday I did three or four certificates which had supplemental notes. I'm trying to put a little bit more information in the certificates themselves. Um, that, but at some point it becomes beyond what will fit or what is really appropriate for a certificate. In those cases, we may do notes. We may do uh, include a copy of articles um, on the subject as well to try to help um, the collector understand the, the finding. And uh, someone has a request that could items that turn out to be a forgery could the reason be returned with the item? And like I say, in some cases, so um, there were two items that we did the certificates yesterday um, that uh, Tom Bienasek, who's uh, a member of our library board of trustees actually was the expert for those. And he, we, we said they were Bueller forgeries. Um, but uh, to that, that, tells the forgery provides 
some basis for trying to, for, for understanding the differences, but um, we aren't for every item going to probably go to the Saran guide or something else and, and try to show all the differences. In, in some cases, um, we don't necessarily know the source of the, the, the forger. Um, in many cases, it, you know, it's a Sparati or it's uh, uh, somebody who was famous um, who did it and, and we can say that. Um, we, we have to try to balance um, the amount of information we can provide and, and do it on a timely basis and at a, a fee that's reasonable. So we'll, we'll continue looking at that and, and seeing what we can do. But in some cases, we'll, we, we will say, you know, the, um, there was one yesterday I did where I believe we said that the text is, the, the font was wrong basically for the overprint. Um, that's a little bit, you know, now somebody could say, well, what should the font be? Or how do I, how do we determine that? You know, how far do you go? And here's another one. Is there a difference between APS expertization and a philatelic foundation expertization? expertization? Um, I would say, yes, there are certainly some differences. Um, the APS does m much more outside the US or, or non-US stamps. The, the Philatelic Foundation um, will do non-US stamps, but they, the experts they have in-house um, are basically just for US stamps. Um, I, I would say the Philatelic Foundation more caters to dealers, auction houses, people doing bulk quantities um, versus the individual collector who may only have one item or a smaller number of items. Um, uh, there's differences in fees. I think our fees in many cases are considerably lower. And the biggest difference is probably we provide a guarantee on our opinions, a five-year limited guarantee, um, which uh, I don't believe the Philatelic Foundation does. What actions, if any, are taken to update the records when catalog numbers are changed? For example, QE4 and QE4A pre-2018 and post-2008. Um, I, I, historically, I, I can't speak because I've been in this role just uh, for a month, month and a, two months. I guess it's going on at this point in time. I know in the past we have reissued certificates to reflect changed catalog numbers. Um, I don't know that we've gone back and um, to the entire um, uh, archive or database of all the past certificates and redone every certificate. But certainly if somebody asks if the catalog number has changed, we will reissue a certificate at no, no cost. And um, so when we reissue a certificate, then that data is is also updated and corrected on the uh, certificate archive. So would you like to comment on the statement, be aware there are items marked fake by one expert service and marked genuine by another. Not all opinions are without issues. Um, we do not mark, we do not mark stamps um, fake. Um, we don't put permanent markings if it's fake. Um, you know, the certificate says that. Certainly there are some expert services that, that do that. And certainly it's possible for expert services to disagree on the opinion. Um, I know that we have one item that was returned to us recently. They got uh, an opinion from another expertizing service or expert. Um, never, I wasn't even aware that they were doing expertizing and we agreed we were sending it out to uh, another expert. We had gone out to, I believe, at least two experts who agreed, but we're sending it out to have another look. We may or may not, um, depending on what that person says, we may or may not agree that we were, were wrong. Um, I think that we were probably right in this case, but I'm waiting to hear back from the third expert um, to see what, what they say. Um, and many of the experts um, used for, uh, are the same, are, same people are used by the Philatelic Foundation and the APS in, in many cases. Um, but um, certainly um, you can have differing opinions in some cases because understandings change over time. Uh, you know, uh, different uh, paper types that at one point were, were thought existed and maybe the 
no longer are believed to exist, but there is something different. So as we learn more about um, information, um, sometimes uh, uh, opinions would change because of that. A person says, I am interested in becoming an expertizer. Do you need anyone to help? And how could I become one? Uh, in certain areas, I'm glad you asked that. In certain areas, yes, I'm actively looking for expertizers. Um, there are areas, like I say, we'd like every stamp to be looked at by at least two people outside of the APS staff, two external experts. There's some areas where I struggle to have two people right now, or maybe we have two, and if one's on vacation or, or has a health issue or whatever, then, then you're down to one. Um, so, um, if some France, Belgium, Italy, Belgian Congo, um, Spain, um, believe it or not, even some, some, some of those are pretty, you know, European countries. Um, those are areas where I'd like to see additional experts that come to mind right off the top of my head. Any others that come to mind for you, Crystal? Tahiti, I think one. Okay, Tahiti. Um, so yes, certainly if somebody's interested, we want to hear from them. We're going to um, want to understand um, why you think you're qualified. Um, it may be obvious, it may not be. Um, we may uh, want to assign you a mentor or somebody. Um, there are some people that I think some of our experts consider themselves still in that uh, uh, learning process um, where they might become a third person to look at it instead of just the two. And we'll compare and, and see how they do compared to the other two. Uh, but certainly um, many exhibitors, people have written articles um, for journals on a specific issue of stamps. Um, those are people that we look at as good candidates. Um, we need them to be able to turn the items around though. We, we would like you to return them within a week of getting them. Certainly no more than two weeks. Um, if uh, somebody can't do that, then um, either <laughs> we may take them off or they may just they just may not get any material if they can't return on a regular basis because it is important that we um, handle the material promptly and get it back to people promptly. All right, I'm going to combine two questions. One is, are you able to expertise covers? And the other, is there a good reference for earliest known uses for stamps on covers? And wondering if this is something that is a standard part of the expertising review for cover submissions. Um, I wouldn't say, okay, certainly we do covers, uh, postal history covers, a lot of them it's for the markings, it's the, the stamps are almost irrelevant um, on the cover. Um, so certainly we do covers. Um, earliest known uses, um, at one point the APS published a, like a small pocket guide. Um, Scott lists them for many issues. Um, we do still, I believe, have a database for U.S. Um, for foreign, we would have to look at other literature. Um, I'm not aware that we have anything, um, you know, there's been about three quarters of a million stamps issued. We certainly don't try, have not tried to maintain a, a database of earliest known use for every one of those stamps. And knowing that we're running out of time, but I think this is an important one. This person says, I've been hesitant to send in some higher value items for fear of loss in the mail. I have APS insurance, but I'm still fearful of a loss. To me, a registered mail item screams, steal me, steal me. Is there a particular mailing method you would recommend? Well, I think registered mail in the, within the US is safe. I'm not, have we ever, are you aware of any losses? Yeah, we have over the years. Okay. Yeah. Um, but um, certainly um, registered mail from abroad, which may not even be treated as registered mail in the US or registered mail to abroad, I'm much more concerned um, with, with many countries. Um, depends, number one, I think you need to look at your own insurance policies. Um, many insurance policies, specialized bill talk insurance policies, um, if it requires a signature and tracking, we'll cover it. Um, now, nobody wants to lose an item, even if it's, if it's you know, covered by insurance. But um, we, a lot of stuff we get comes certified mail um, that doesn't have any insurance through the USPS. But um, I think that it's, it's rare that we have a loss period, correct, Crystal? Right, right. 
Also a couple other options, um, people use USPS Express Mail, which gets to, you know, gets to the destination within about two to three days max, or FedEx is, it's a little more costly, but it's pretty safe and quick, so. And we'll do one, options. and we'll do one more question. How many items do you process within a year? Uh, I think I actually said that at the beginning, about 5,000. We'd like to get that up a little bit, but we're doing around 5,000. Last month was about 495 items, I think, received. Um, so that was a good month for us. And with that question and answer, we will conclude the session of APS Talks. Thank you to Ken and Crystal for this informative session. And in, do you have an email address if people want to email you with further questions? Certainly. Do we have a general APEX one? APEX is here. A, yeah, APEX at stamps.org. A-P-E-X at stamps.org. That will actually come to both Crystal and I. Um, or you can, um, our individual email addresses are also certainly available on the APS website. And those of you who have tuned in, if you are not an APS member, make sure you check out our website, stamps.org, for a special that is going on, and that will entitle you to reduced rates for APEX services. So don't forget to look for other stamp show offerings that may be of interest to you. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of 2020 virtual stamp show. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh